wars, they're famous. Some wars are infamous. Some wars, they're perplexing. The Spanish-American War is none of those three things. It's famous in certain parts of the world. I do believe it's uh, quite popular in some parts of the American curriculum, judging by some of the stories my friends and students have about their times at school. There are also some parts of the American uh, school, uh, school system which seem to forget it completely, because I've had students come and look at me and go, We fought a war against Spain? Yes. There again, to be fair, those are the same students who get very perplexed when they start hearing about the War of 1812. So maybe it's not the American system, maybe it's just those students, but they are doing history at university level, so I presume they have a passing interest in the subject. Anyway, leaving that to one side, the Spanish-American War. This is one of the most political hot buttons you can press as a historian. I can guarantee now that when this long patrol comes out, this video, there will be a tremendous amount of comments that will wind up on it at some point. Maybe not when it comes out, but maybe a few months from now when some website or whatever finds it, which will be debating the politics of the war. That is not what I will be doing. Okay, I'm looking at the cruiser action of the war, Spanish-American War, which seeing as pretty much every single battle and every single event was cruiser or cruiser related, is pretty much going to mean the whole war. And it does mean I'm going to have to go into some of the politics and some of the strategy and some of the discussions to go around it. But, and I say this as a glorious glutamus maximus on this question... I'm not getting involved in the politics because honestly, and this is a cop out, but I'm British. It doesn't interest me. What interests me is the ships and what they're doing with them. And that's what this video is about. And if I was going to do the full discussion, because I haven't taught this in 10 years. The last time I taught the Spanish-American War, I was covering for a friend, as a favour, and it was a series of six lectures, each two hours long, plus about two seminars a week, uh, each also about two hours long for six weeks. So it was 12 hours of lecture instruction and the class divided into two seminar groups so they got 12 hours of seminars as well. So roughly 24 hours over six weeks plus a reading list and that was what we taught. And I would say this video is going to cover approximately one-tenth of the content of the taught lectures because that is how complicated and interlaced the politics of both international politics and domestic politics in America and Spain and Cuba and the Philippines and Puerto Rico and all these places are in this conflict. It is not really one war. And the fact, the fact that we combine it together as one war is more a classification scenario, but it's like calling the Battle Atlantic the Battle Atlantic, or to extent some of the big battles in the Pacific War, the Battle of This or That, and you sort of go, well, hang on, though, there's about a dozen different battles going on over various days. Well, this is, there are about a dozen different wars going on. The Cuban Revolt, by the time this war takes place, has been going on for roughly 30 years on and off, where at best there have been times of peace where both sides are busily working out whether they actually can buy uh, fire firearms or whether they should be starting to sharpen rocks 
And I'm not talking about the Spanish or the Cubans doing this. I'm talking both sides, because let's be honest, the Spanish infrastructure and logistical support and financial support was often lacking. So it was often both sides debating whether the best option was to sharpen rocks. We have the Monroe Doctrine, which by 1898 is 75 years old, having come through in 1823. So the US is technically committed to the idea of getting colonial powers out. They were slightly distracted by a civil war, which has now been sorted, but, you know, in the nicest way, they're still healing from that. And there is the fact that whilst they want to get colonial powers out, there is the huge neighbour to the north, who is technically a colonial dependency, but Canada is special. They're a dominion and one of the first, and they are, so there's a debate as to American politics at the time as whether they are actually self-governing or governed by Britain. That's a whole different level of politics you can add on. And then we can go into South America, which is, well, technically independent, but very heavily in the British sphere of influence and the German sphere of influence. And the Americans keep having to deal with the Germans as a rising threat because the Germans keep wanting places in the sun. And then you have the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French and the British and the various other powers around the Caribbean and other things, scenarios all around them. And yet the Americans have technically been committed to independence of the Americas for 75 years. So please note, if anyone complains, I'll let me put it another way, anyone comments, and if you feel comments going, you didn't include this in this, what is probably going to be about an hour and a half long video. Please note. Probably, I just decided I didn't have the time. Because this is made from my notes, which were originally for 12 hours of lectures and 12 hours of seminars. I don't think my friend even teaches the course anymore. I think they moved departments within the same university. They've gone from history to international relations. It happens. No. The Spanish-American War. Theoretically, it's kicked off by what's going on in Cuba. But the fact is, what's going on in Cuba has been going on for 30 years, and the Americans have been getting gradually more and more interested in it. And when I say more and more interested in it, they've been getting more and more economic links to Cuba, which means they have been getting more and more involved and linked with it. But that doesn't necessarily mean they understand it. And it doesn't necessarily mean they always know how they're putting themselves forward to it. But also, it is very much connected to the fact that well it's very much connected to the fact that cuba has been part of the american discussion for a long time by this point in fact cuba at several points has been viewed as potentially another state um before the Civil War, various interests had tried to uh, 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 to make the USA purchase Cuba, like they'd purchased Louisiana and Alaska, etc., to convert it into a new slave state. You know, um, this was proposed as part of 1854, and the anti-slavery forces rejected it. But the Americans had kept looking at Cuba, and to an extent. They get involved in Cuba because they see it through a fixed perspective. But it does offer itself to being a unifying force. The fact is, America at this point is looking for an external enemy to try and unify around. It's like Seward's idea from the pre-Civil War period has never gone away. When he was looking at, when the Secretary of State Seward was looking around the world going well <clears throat> if we start a war against britain the uh, the 
uh, confederacy will immediately stop their secession, join up, and because we'll go to war against Britain, it'll be an external enemy. That would have been a terrible thing to do in the 1860s. America might be able to, the, the Union might be able to beat up the Confederacy in the 1860s. Beating up the British Empire in the 1860s uh, would have been a different matter. But leaving that to one side, they're still looking for it. And thanks to a combination of what's called yellow journalism, and honestly, the fact that the idea had never gone away of making Cuba another state, Cuba sort of starts to become this external enemy. And in terms of not Cuba itself, but the Spanish occupation of Cuba. And so there are issues going on. One of those issues is that Cuba represents for America quite a golden opportunity. In August 1896, the British stop Spain's attempt to get European support for their policies in Cuba. Basically stops it dead. And this comes at a time when a few months earlier, the US Senate had recognized Cuban belligerency. And then in February of 1896. So by December, of that year, 1896, President Cleveland said that USA may take action in Cuba if Spain failed to resolve the crisis there. The crucial thing is, what it, then everyone's leaving open what a resolution to the crisis looks like for them. So we fast forward to 1898, Spain grants limited autonomy to Cuba. That's lovely. But even as they're doing that, the US, under now a new president, McFinley, send down the USS Maine. Now the USS Maine is a very, very lovely ship. It's a pretty ship from a certain perspective, if you're looking at it in the right light. It is the first armored cruiser of the US Navy. It's sometimes described as a second class battleship because especially when people are focusing on the fact that it and Texas are quite similar. But battleships and cruisers can be quite similar. Usually, in if we consider the traditional period actually, or this uh, this time, the battleship would be he have heavier armor but more concentrated and it would be slightly smaller but have more bigger guns and would be slower. The cruiser would be slightly larger, slightly longer, would be faster and designed therefore for cruising, but would probably carry the same guns, but would have slightly less armor because it's trying to cover more area. That roughly describes Maine and Texas. But Maine has many issues, not least of which she was designed for one type of co a coal and then given the other. She said designed for anthracitic coal and then given bitumens. Now, she's deployed down to Cuba as a status. She is, as I said, either a second class battleship or an armored cruiser, depending on who you're talking to. Armored cruiser in reality, but she has the status. She is a status piece. And she's deployed down there with her crew. She's there to show American intent and interest. This is naval presence, naval diplomacy. And unfortunately, in the evening of 15th of February, 1898, she blows up. Taking nearly 270 of her crew with her. That's three quarters. The US Navy then has an internal fight. The official board of inquiry rules that it would have been sunk by an external explosion from a mine. Many other officers thought that it might have been ignited by spontaneous fire. A ship's magazines had been ignited by spontaneous fire in a coal bunker. 
because bitumous coal was which was name was now it was using was known for releasing fire damp which is the gases given off by coal especially bitumous coal when it gets hot now fire damp is primarily methane In 18, 1974, Admiral Rick Rover does a investigation which agrees with this hypothesis. But the fact is, the Spanish did an investigation at a time and came back with that hypothesis. There was a naval engineer at in the U.S. Navy sort of headquarters who agreed with that hypothesis and wrote that. And People like Teddy Roosevelt, etc., science him. Teddy Roosevelt said, we don't have enough information, so you can't possibly say what it is. Teddy Roosevelt was, to an extent, looking for a reason to get involved. Cuba was becoming not just a cause celeb, but becoming a unifying force. There's the fact it was something both the northern states with their desire for well their, now their sort of projected desire and independent idea of freeing slavery and independence and a traditional idea of the americans to free nations from colonial powers monroe doctrine combined with the southern states who have a desire for Cuba to be free because it's connected to their commercial interests, because they have a lot of commercial trading going on, and because they see the Spanish as an obstacle to them having more influence, I would say, over Cuba, but also more influence over the realities of Cuba in terms of its economic integration. The Spanish report isn't published at all in the American press. It gets barely any attention. And so, if you are left with a scenario where your presumption is that your ship was blown up by a mine, and this is where we get into the first real trouble, because this is usually where uh, issues an armor cruiser, so this is the first cruiser involvement in the conflict, but B, Usually, just the point where conspiracy theories start to jump around and go, ah, well, actually, what really happened was the Americans blew her up to provide justification for war. No. And there's a very simple reason to say no for that. Politicians, anyone involved in such a thing, are notoriously bad at keeping secrets. And the sheer amount of people you would need to have involved in such a scenario would mean you couldn't keep a secret. However, politicians are also known to be the type who take advantage of circumstance. And your ship handily blowing up, which provides you with an excuse, is amazing because then you have no evidence of conspiracy, because there wasn't one. You're just taking advantage of some, an accident, which you can say wasn't an accident, to justify what you wanted to do anyway. And why do I say it's what you want to do anyway? Because the US has been sending out officers from about 1890, 1887 onwards to various postings around the world telling them to prepare for war with Spain. It can go, I can go one better because in 1896, William Warren Kimball, US Naval Academy graduate, intelligence officer completes the strategic study of the implications of war with Spain. This plan called for Operation to Free Cuba through naval action, which was going to include blockade, an attack on Manila, and attacks on the Spanish Mediterranean coast. That's in 1896, and that's just one study that we found out about. I'm fairly certain there are more, because the US is full of very capable officers at this period who are very skilled at what they do and who can very quickly, and I mean this with great respect, very quickly churn out such studies. The fact is the US is far more prepared for war than Spain is.
yes, their war, the big war, the American Civil War, was over 23 years ago by this point. But they have a long legacy still going on. They ha still have a large number of experienced officers going around. You have to remember how massive the US Navy got in that period, how massive the US Army got in that period, but also the Confederate Army got in that period. And remember, the US is now drawing on both pools of officers. And they do draw on both pools of those officers. Famous generals from the Confederate side will take part in the war fighting for the, uh, fighting for the US. And that's important. The war is a busy one. There are lots of events. But again, if we're going back to causes of the war, one of the big issues that happens is there is an oopsie. The outgoing at the beginning, this is actually before the blowing up of Maine. The outgoing ambassador to the US, Enrique Dupe de Lomme, a name which is more synonymous with French armoured cruisers than anything else, but we'll leave that to one side, resigns. He resigns on the 8th of February. He's heading home. On 9th of February, the New York Journal publishes his letter which criticised the President McKinley. Now, giving Frank... How do I put this? Frank advice and frank assessments of the leaders of the countries you're representing your country to is a criteria for ambassadors. It's what they're there for, to get a first-hand trusted interpretation of what this person is. That is what their entire duty is really supposed to be. It's about being the first person contact with the leadership of that other country so you have someone from your side interpreting the personalities, the postures, the, the everything for you. The problem is those frank letters, they tend to not be the most flattering things. Especially to politicians who tend to want to craft an image of themselves as being close to perfection. So, it becomes public. Dupuy de Lome had resigned a day before, so there's technically no Spanish minister in Washington to report. In fact, there won't be until Valentine's Day, which is when Louis Polo de Benavi uh, is Minister of Spain in Washington. 14th of February. The evening of the 15th, the USS Maine explodes. From that point on, there is a rapid acceleration towards war. A very rapid acceleration towards war. The Governor General of the Philippines warns the Spanish Minister for the Colonies in March that Commodore George Dewey had received orders to move on Manila. Now, the fact is, that would make sense, because Dewey is commanding the Asiatic Squadron, which is the only major powers force in the, China, in the South China Sea, China Station area, that doesn't have its own infrastructure, that doesn't have its own secure port, and importantly for the Americans here, is also one of the most worked up fleets in the world. Because Dewey had been sent out, a veteran of the Civil War had been sent out with orders to make that squadron as capable for war as possible because it was likely there was going to be war with Spain. And I'll get into that in a second, but uh, yes, do I re believe he received the orders on the 3rd of March? 
I believe that the Spanish learned about the orders on the 3rd of March, but um, considering how quickly Dewey will turn up in Manila, after gathering his fleet together, theoretically, and pulling it all in, considering the average pace of advance of that likely fleet of being roughly 8 knots at best, because some of those ships' top speed is 12 knots, so that's certainly not their cruising speed. Hmm. It would be interesting. In actual fact, we know that Roosevelt, who was assistant, Theodore Roosevelt, who was assistant secretary of the Navy, ordered Dewey to take the squadron to Hong Kong, Britain, keep full of coal. In the event of declaration of war of Spain, your duty will be to see that the Spanish squadron does not leave the Asiatic coast and then offensive operations in the Philippine Islands. He, Dewey would depart from Hong Kong, roughly, on the 27th of April. And the battle in Manila Bay, the first battle of the war, would be on the 1st of May. And yes. So, before we ask, a <coughs> war which is started over a ship blowing up in Havana, theoretically, which was there to monitor the Cuban revolt and protect US citizen interests in, the, in Cuba, has now it resulted in the most powerful and best trained squadron at the outbreak of the war available to anyone leaving a British controlled port where they have been supplied with coal and support to attack uh, to go and attack the Spanish fleet in Manila the Philippines which is itself in another form of revolution because whilst they'd had a rebellion going on which had been solved, then the internal court politics of Spain had seen the governor of the Philippines replaced with someone who was more supportive of the new government in Spain, and that had started rebellion because the new guy wasn't liked by the, re the rebels. This is why this war gets interesting. And the force that's going down there, well, I'm missing out one of the cruisers, of course, Olympia. She's going to be in the next slide. She gets a whole slide to herself. Olympia deserves that. So please, no dispute on that one. We've got Baltimore. We've got, in the center, we've got Boston. We've got Raleigh. We've got petrol, Concord gunboats, and we've got the USS McCulloch. We have got George Dewey, who is going to consider running for the Democrats as a presidential candidate at some at one point in about 1900, who is a Commodore at this point, but in 1903 will be made Admiral of the Navy. And I still say I'm not quite sure whether this is recognized as a six star, because whilst I realize there have been some statements to that effect, the U.S., and its naval ranking system gets a bit fuzzy once you get above four star. They do get a bit, oh, what, what, what's this one? What's that one? And there were a whole sort of issues of when they were making various generals and the ranks of generals and general of all the armies. And yes, the, the, U, the US Congress doesn't like having military ranks that are too senior, it seems, in this period or pretty much any period. But Dewey is fantastic. He is one of the hardest taskmasters you can possibly send out. And there is not a chance that someone who is a veteran of the Battle of Fort Jackson and St. Philip, the Battle of New Orleans, the Battle of, uh, of Port Hudson, the First Battle of Fort Fisher, the Second Battle of Fort Fisher, is not going to be obsessed with gunnery. Now, I'm not saying his squadron is particularly good at gunnery, but they are good with gunnery by the standards of the time. They can actually hit their targets occasionally. He has also served in the Lighthouse Board, the Board of Inspection Survey. He was even at one point put on the USS Constitution. 
old iron sides herself. So he's had a long career. And he is given some very good ships to command. And this is the other point. His ships are capable vessels. They are very capable vessels when we consider what they're going to be going up against. Because these ships are not just well trained, despite the fact they are the only power without, and this is a big point, without a supporting infrastructure base, without the facilities to support infrastructure in the base that they could have out there, they have actually been very well supported. Yes, the Germans seized Singtau in 1897, so um, a year earlier the Germans have got a base for their fleet in, the, in Asia. Which is annoying. And by the way, the Germans will also be uh, wandering around the Philippines after the Battle of Manila going, well, if you're not going to send troops, perhaps we should get involved, you know, because we're Germany. At which point the British are going, do you want some ships to move troops? Hence the names of some of the ships moving troops are very interesting if they're American ships. Very interesting. Ah, oh, life is fun. 3D chess. So. The fleet that will fight at Manila Bay involves, for the Americans, the USS Olympia, the flagship, built as really a commerce raiding cruiser. She is fast, long-ranged, and well-armed. The Americans then turn very much more inward-looking. They turn on one part of Mahan. This is, the, this is the point I often think that's forgotten with Mahan, and I'm not going to be universally loving towards him during this video. I have to admit, there is a point to it in after another battle where I'm really quite annoyed with him. But... He makes a very good case for a fleet, battle fleet, but he does make the case for the wider operations. Because in America, you have to sell the battle fleet because they always un they understand the need for wider operations. And in fact, this whole war is one long cruiser operation. It's going to be a cruiser force. It's the USS Olympia, which is a protected cruiser of 5,870 tons. The USS Baltimore, protected cruiser of 4,600 tons. The USS Raleigh, protected cruiser of 3,200 tons. The USS Boston, protected cruiser of 3,200 tons. The USS Concord, gunboat of 1,700 tons. The USS Petrel, gunboat of 867 tons. And a revenue cutter. All this, this whole fleet, this whole battle is fought by cruisers. There are cruisers on the other side. There are cruisers on the American side. But the thing is, the Americans will come out of this war with an obsession with building battleships. No idea why, really. They show the capabilities of cruisers. They show the adaptability of cruisers. Armored cruisers win them the war. They do everything for them. And they come out of this war and go... What we really need is battleships. You can argue it's the isolationist stream coming on. You can argue it's obsession with looking as powerful, but not actually being as able to reach out around the world as other powers. But whatever the reason, and it's something which is... Honestly, I can't make my mind up on. This is why I say I don't know. Uh, there are many historians who put forward many good arguments about why... But honestly, the service of US Olympia is not a good example of why they should have gone for battleships. Because she leads the attack. She has four 8-inch guns in two twin turrets. She has ten 5-inch guns, which are ranged along the side, five per side. And six torpedo tubes, top speed 20 knots. She is Dewey's flagship, leading into the battle. She couldn't have a better commander for her, one who isn't who's going to be use her aggressively. He's going to be putting her to uh, to her pace. She could also not do better than she does, and the fact that she's still around today and you can go see her is wonderful. You know, it's another one of my on my list of dream ships, and I have a list of dream ships. 
This is one of them. She deserves it. She deserves a lot more respect and love than even she gets. But the point about the Battle of Middle Bay is this. On the 1st of May, the US Navy's Asiatic Squadron goes in, starts firing, fires for mm, roughly a couple of hours. They start, uh, you know, they get in at 5.15 a.m. They keep firing from 5.41 when when Dewey issues the order to Gridley, his captain, flag captain, who dies not long after the battle, you may fire when ready, Gridley, which is a very nice sort of British style. He dies on June the 5th, uh, 1898 in Japan, having been sent there for medical support. And they target on the flagship and they keep on firing. They are non-stop firing with five inch guns, eight inch guns, everything they've got is firing on this Spanish squadron. And the Spanish and the land batteries, etc. and forts are all returning fire as best they can. At 7.45 a.m., Gridley informs Dewey that he's been told they only have 15 rounds of five inch ammunition remaining per gun. So Dewey orders a withdrawal. They withdraw not that far away. And he orders the crews to have breakfast. That's what he's going to do. At this point, at least three of the Spanish ships have broken into flames. So had one of the Americans. All the fires being put out apparent, uh, without apparent injury to ships. Generally speaking, nothing of great importance had happened, they felt. Montojo used this gap in the firing to move his remaining ships into Bacor Bay, um, where they were ordered to resist as long as possible. Montojo is the Spanish Admiral. Montojo is trying his best. What's also interesting is that the original message has apparently been garbled because uh, instead of only 15 rounds of ammunition per gun remaining, the message had meant to say only 15 rounds of ammunition per gun had been expended. So they had plenty of ammunition left. So they returned to the fighting and continued on fighting. And sunk them. Now, how can you do that? How can a squadron come in in this period, which are theoretically both cruiser squadrons come in and match in? Well, here is the reality. Montojo is an admiral. You, um, Patricia Montojo, your person, is a, ver a fairly decent admiral. But whereas Dewey had arrived to take command as the second ad admiral, or second sort of commodore, to receive pretty much orders to prepare for war with Spain, uh, he's appointed in eight. He starts positioning for the post in 1896. He's appointed the post in 1897. He gets to host his pennant aboard USS Olympia in Nagasaki at, in 1898, January 1898, um, and goes to Hong Kong to inspect the US warships all lying up in Hong Kong Harbor. That's where they're basing from. He's got a pretty much professional force, a pretty much worked up force, and he continues working up. He basically spends his time from January working it up and working it up hard. In contrast, Patricio Montojo Yepasan arrives roughly March, maybe a, bit, maybe a little bit earlier. There's a bit of dispute as February as March. 
We know he doesn't have a meeting with the captain's colony general till March the 15th, 1898. So it's a couple of months later. His ships, he describes, were small and mostly gunboats there to support their actions against the Filipino rebels. They weren't really there to fight the US Asiatic Squadron. And we can get even more in depth than this. Because the Caribbean squadron, we know, had not conducted fleet exercises or even proper gunnery drills when Yesheva, Sereva, the admiral who takes command of them, since 1884 to save money. So, 15 odd years. In 18, 15, 13 years, uh, 14, 15 years in 1898. That's the premier fleet of the Spanish overseas forces, the Caribbean fleet. Can't imagine Patricio Montoya Passon's fleet was in better nick than that. Then we have the fleet he actually has in terms of their ships available. So, please note, they are divided into engaged, unengaged, and shore defences. The engaged vessels, well, that's Reina Cristiana. It's an unprotected cruiser of 3,000 tons with six 6.4-inch guns, top speed of 16 knots. And, uh, yeah, unprotected cruiser, that's his flagship. Casilla, also an unprotected cruiser, 3,289 tons with four 5.9-inch and two 4.7-inch guns. Her 8-inch guns had been removed to equip the shore batteries. So she's a floating battery as, well, repair of the leaks had mobilized her propeller shaft, so she can't move at all. Don Antonio de Ula, uh, unprotected cruiser of a foul, roughly 1,100 tons, uh, two 4.7-inch guns on a starboard side only. Um, her engines were ashore under repair. Her entire port side armament had been removed to equip the shore batteries. Uh, Don Juan de Austria, uh, another unprotected cruiser of 1,152 tons. Um, four 4.7-inch guns, top speed of 13 knots. So, then we have two Ellswick cruisers. They are protected, but remember, they're only 1,030 tons. And they're armed with six 4.7-inch guns. They're Isla de Cuba and Isla de Luzon. And finally, we have Marcos del Guero, gunboat of 492 tons, one 6.4 inch gun, 2.4.7 inch guns. The unengaged vessels that are also available, well, there's Velasso, another un unprotected cruiser of uh, 1,100 tons, roughly. Um, her boilers are ashore being replaced, and all her guns were on the Cabello Island battery. Uh, El Coro, a gunboat, which had three 4.7-inch guns and three secondary uh, rapid-fire guns of undetermined calibre. One torpedo tube. Didn't do anything in the battle. Um, General Leza, whose um, 4.7-inch guns were apparently removed to the El Freyel Island for the battery, and so didn't take part in the battle. And Argos, which had one 3.5-inch gun. And, by the way, the Spanish had 19 torpedo tubes between them, which are all considered serviceable, but not a single serviceable torpedo. Not a single one. Shore defences. Well, Fort San Antonio Abad, um, built 1584 originally, um, had a single one 9.4 inch gun which had enough range to reach dewey ships at their closest approach didn't really fire that much fort san philippe built 1609 uh it's a small castle on a sandbar protected by a breakwater separated from a city by a moat didn't really do much cavite fort um a fortified naval base and shipyard in Cavite City. Um, again, not much there. 
Uh, the corridor battery, which was supposed to secure the entrance to Manila Bay, did not fire at all. The Capella battery, another one supposed to secure the entrance to Manila Bay, did not fire. The El Freo battery, entrance to, also to secure the entrance to Manila Bay, fired three rounds before USS Raleigh silenced her after hitting the battery with a single shell. The Kanakoa battery, located in town of Kanakoa, armed with a single 4.7-inch gun, did not fire. The Sangle Point battery, located at the Sangley Point Naval Base, which was armed with three 64-pound muzzle-loading cannon and two 5.9-inch guns. I need a 5.9-inch guns fired, because they were the ones with range to reach them. And the Malate battery, which is located in the Manila district of Malate. Did not fire. Did not fire at all. Please note. There is an advantage to actually firing. Because if we consider the American ships. They fired a total of 5,859 shells. Now... If we exclude shells which hit land targets, of which we know one definitely hit, Raleigh, of course, hit that battery. There were only actually 145 shells which hit Spanish in vessels which were actually fighting, the seven vessels which were actually fighting. The Reina Cristiana and the Castilla, the two big ships, which are, of course are 3,000 ton unprotected cruisers, received 81 hits between them. The Don Antonio de Ulla was hit 33 times. The Don Juan de Austria, 13 times. Uh, the de Ulla only had two 4.7 inch guns, so on her starboard side. So the fact that she had to be hit 33 times to put her down does tell you something about the spirit of the crew fighting. The Don Juan de Austria, 13 times. The Marcos de Duro, 10 times. Which, frankly, for a vessel which is 492 tons. The Isle de Cuba, 5 times. And the Isle de Luzon, 3 times. The two Ellswick cruisers. Paul McCulloch didn't actually get much into actual fighting range. Um, they were kept back because of their light, light, light armament and lack of armour. Although McCulloch's chief engineer did die of a heart attack. Now, why is this battle quite so interesting? Because you've basically shown the difference between a protected cruiser fleet and an unprotected cruiser fleet. The protected cruisers, the entirety of the USA's fleet, are protected cruisers of 3,000 plus tons. Yes, there are two gunboats sitting along, coming along in, but they're hanging back. It's the four protected cruisers which are leading the way. And if we consider that, the Olympia at 5,870 tons displaces as much as the Spanish flagship. Actually, displaces more of that than the Spanish, Spanish flagship this, uh, combined with the two Ellswick cruisers they have. The unprotected Spanish flagship and the two Ellswick cruisers. Let alone, well, any two ships... The two larger ships, they out, they pretty almost out this place. Because the two larger ships of the Spanish fleet combined come in at 3,331 tons. 6,331 tons, sorry. 5,870 tons? That ship alone almost weighs as much as you add in the Baltimore with 4,600 tons, the Raleigh and the Boston each at 3,200 tons, 
and you start to realize the US are turning up to fight. Really turning up to fight. They have brought not far short, and I do say this carefully, not far short of 17,000 tons worth of cruiser to the fight. And the Spanish? Well, they're matching in with closer to 10,000 tons. If we're being nice, 10,500 tons. But still, rather than blaming the fact that most of his fleet doesn't have engines or boilers or guns and it can't be moved and that when he turned up it was in disarray, the Spanish government tried to blame Patricio Montilla Person. And this leads to A, one of the most wonderful stories of history in that Dewey himself writes this note to be presented to court. Although without accurate knowledge as to the condition of your ships, I have no hesitation in saying to you what I have already had the honour to report to my government, that your defence at Cavite was gallant in the extreme. The fighting of your flagship, which was singled out for attack, was especially worthy of a place in the traditions of valour of your nation. A British steamer captain, I'm not quite sure of their name wrote this. Montojo stood upright in the stern, perfectly unmoved, although splashes of water flew repeatedly over the little craft. It was an example of unparalleled heroism. He tried his best. He really did try his best. But there wasn't anything he could do. One of the interesting things that you sort of start to consider is when you go look later in the war, when the Spanish are rapidly trying to send out their only battleship and their newest, most modern cruiser, and sort of send this force out with the idea to, you know, beat up Dewey's fleet. I don't think A Day would, a Camara's flying relief column, as it's sometimes called, would have. At, named after the Admiral put in charge of them, would have actually beaten up Dewey. I think, honestly, Dewey's squadron was was worked up to the level that they would have had a hard time, but they have ultimately won. But if those sort of ships had actually been there under Montoya's command, and they'd had torpedoes, and they'd had their ships working, and all the things they've been doing as they were supposed to, if you really are an actual major power rather than providing a simulated we look like a major power then it could have been a very different battle unlikely but if everything was actually as it was supposed to be it's certainly possible wrong way then we have the taking of guam now the taking of guam is the most keystone cop operation you will ever hear about. The fact is these are the orders. Upon receipt of this order, which is forwarded by the steamship City of please note this City of Peking to you at Honolulu, you'll proceed with the Charleston and the City of Peking in company to Manila, Philippine Islands on your way and you are hereby directed to stop at the Spanish island of Guam you will such force as may be necessary to capture the port of Guam making prisoners of the governor and other officials any armed force that may be there you will also destroy any fortifications on said island and any Spanish naval vessels that may be there or in the immediate vicinity these operations at the island of Guam should be very brief and should not occupy more than one or two days you will make uh, such use of of it as you consider uh, no you will should you find any coal and the island of guam you'll make such use of it as you consider desirable it is left to your discretion whether or not you destroy it from the island of guam proceed to manila and report to rear admiral george dewey usn for the duty in, in squadron under his command yes dewey had got promoted yes they are sending out another armored cruisers cruiser 
Yes, the Charleston has literally been activated for this. Okay. The Charleston will take part in this in June and will actually capture Guam, Guam in the 20, between the 20th and 21st of June. She had been laid down in 1887. She had been launched in 1888. She had been commissioned in 1889. She had been decommissioned in 1896. She was recommissioned on the 5th of May, 1898. So she was recommissioned four days after Battle of Manila Bay to go and reinforce the squadron. They were sending out ammunition. They were sending out new ships. They were sending out everything they could to reinforce that squadron while still keeping their major force to try and tie up the supposed Spanish critical fleet of the Caribbean squadron. The Caribbean squadron, which was this mighty force. The Spanish had always been as the, the jewel in the crown. Their equivalent of the British Mediterranean fleet was the Caribbean squadron, which, as I have already mentioned earlier, hasn't actually conducted a fighting live fire drill war fighting exercise since 1884 by this point. Anyway, so... The taking of Guam. The Charleston turns up. The Charleston doesn't have the best accuracy in its gunfire. You can tell that. They fire 13 shots from three guns at a static fort which has no artillery in it and cannot fire back and they do not hit it once. In fact, they fire the shots in such a formation that the Spanish actually think they are saluting them because they don't realize there's a war going on because they haven't been told. So they're actually sending off the light artillery pieces so they can salute back. They're having to send off to them to get them because they are not stored in the fort where they are. No, no, no. They are. They, they're elsewhere on the island. So they have to send for them. And this is the actual thing. The Spanish officers who will see this on the beach go out to the ship in a lighter provided by a rich merchant vessel, a merchantman, to get out to the ship. They get to the ship. They're told they're now a prisoner. And they're then given parole to go back and tell the governor what's going on. The governor, uh, not on their way back, they actually meet the guns coming and they order them to turn around and go home. And those guns are actually found later stuck in the mud with the crew, uh, with the soldiers trying to get them out by the US when they're wandering around. It's just, it's just embarrassing, this entire scenario. It's made worse by the governor, who keeps trying to try some funny stuff. But don't worry, aboard the ships, the Australia, the city of Peking and the city of Sydney, the free merchant vessels, which have been turned into transport military units, are carrying their second Oregon Volunteer Infantry Regiment, the first California Volunteer Infantry Regiment, and the 14th U.S. Infantry, well, companies A, C, D, E, and F. I'm not sure what, where Company B is. Company B, obviously, is just not wanted at this point. They're off doing something else. Company B. Being Company B. Anyway. And the California Volunteer Heavy Artillery. Batteries A and D. Again, where are batteries B and C? Do they not want them? Do they not feel the need for their love? Do they do they think they're too much for taking them as much? I don't know. But all I do know is that those are free transports which have very interesting names. So, they turn up. These orders go backwards and forwards. The Americans find out there is a guy there called Francisco Putash who has American citizenship. And is also the large, um, richest merchant on the island. He's doing most of the trade. And he provides the vessels which allow them to take coal from the merchant vessels to Charleston. Because she's starting to run out of coal. They at one point consider blowing up the fort. But then they find out the fort is horrendously old and practically an archaeology site. In fact, it's falling down so much they presumed it was actually a ruin. So uh, they don't bother with that one. The Spanish governor, governor tries to pretend that he can't come aboard the ship, so the captain has to come to him to, uh, for him to surrender to him. The captain sends a lieutenant. Lieutenant goes ashore. The governor uh, tries to act outraged. The lieutenant says, you have 30 minutes before we land actual proper troops and start taking this island. The 
only 50 troops of the garrison are surprisingly close by. And the governor decides to surrender. Which is good. It's just... And they leave Frank Putash in charge while the Americans go on to Minerva, taking with them the governor, his officers, the garrison, all their own troops, and not everyone else on them. So basically, the island is... Conquered with firing 13 shots that miss. It's a cruiser action, though. Then we have Guantanamo Bay. And this is an even more absurd battle. So. The US have, of course, announced a blockade of Cuba and blockade of all Spanish territories. Why pointless? Well, ah, <laughs> oh, let's see. So, the first vessels to turn up in this area are the St. Louis, which is a transatlantic liner which the Americans are taking up because they don't have enough cruisers. They don't have enough ships to do a blockade. So, they get her, they get Yankee, which is the one above Marblehead here, they use them as basically ships, the auxiliary cruisers. Marblehead is the only actual unprotected cruiser amongst them. Lovely. So St. Louis turns up, goes, Hello, we're here! A gunboat comes out and St. Louis goes, You're going to scratch the paintwork, and frankly, we're not built for this, so we're going away. And then they return as a group together. The Spanish gunboats come out. The Spanish gunboats realize they are fighting free ships. And, uh, yeah, they decide to go away. It was all rather pointless because if you consider the size of the fleet coming out there, what was the point in the gunboats coming out? And to an extent, yeah. So this is the mighty Spanish Caribbean squadron. This is the thing that's really scaring the Americans, that demands all their concentrated firepower, every battleship they can get, every large cruiser, oh, it's got their North the Atlantic squadron, it's got their flying squadron, it's got everything there, it's got their best admirals, it's got everything there watching it. This is the Infanta Maria Teresa, which is the flagship of Pascal Serra de Etopte, um, who is probably the best admiral the Spanish have involved in this war, and I would argue definitely up there with Dewey as best admiral in this war. Um, I'm going to get into trouble here, but I have my two, favor uh, two best admirals, and top three admirals are actually Dewey, Servera, and Modra. Um, I'm sorry, the American admirals, they are turning up and they actually have firepower. <laughs> The fact that the Spanish admirals lead their crews and get their ships in anywhere approaching fighting order, considering what they're fighting. And if you think Congress is hard, there is nothing compared to getting money out of the Spanish government at this point. Um, it's frankly amazing. Severa so is... Well, he's got the Cristo Colon, which is a Giuseppe Garibaldi class. But um, the Ellswick Ordnance Company guns, which are famous worldwide for producing the highest quality guns around the world. Apparently, the 10-inch guns that the were supplied were not of the correct standard for the Spanish. So they withheld payment and had to send them back. So she went to sea with wooden guns instead. So she didn't have her 10-inch guns. So uh, this vessel had uh, wooden primary guns, which is why I find it funny when people refer to her secondary guns as secondary because she has wooden tubes instead of her primary guns so they are by default therefore become her primary armament because she does not have any other armament but leaving that to one side he has the Infanta Maria Teresa, the Vincenia, the Almirante Ocuero and the Christopher Colon and he managed to get two destroyers there he does start off with more but they get dropped along the way and terror will discuss later so the Spanish Caribbean squadron they are, with out a doubt, some of the most interesting ships put together. 
There is one interesting point which I would like to make, okay? And that is the descriptions of Pluton and Fura, because there are various people who make sort of claims about them. They talk to them about this, that, and the other, whether they are torpedo boats or they are torpedo boat destroyers. There is a debate over Pluton and Fura over exactly what they were, okay? Torpedo boat destroyer would seem to be their designation some people would go with they'll say they have six uh, they have two 14 pounder quick firing guns eight six pounder quick firing guns and two port uh, torpedo tubes they have the ability therefore to protect their ships they're escorting from torpedo attack from other torpedo boats i'm not sure whether i would quite call them along the torpedo boat destroyer route though to me, they're a step along the line to becoming a torpedo boat destroyer, but they don't seem to be quite there. But that's my view. Okay, Pluton and Fura, they're the ones which are actually working there. Terra is back in... Back in Puerto Rico. Yeah, she is in Puerto Rico. Or she... Yeah, in Puerto Rico. And then we have the Infanta Maria Teresa, Vincendia, Amarante Oqueda, and the Cristobal Cabalon. These are lovely ships, but they are not what you would call the most powerful vessels in the world. In fact, the cruisers, roughly 7,000 tons, did have armor. Their armament was, well, let's put it this way. Spat Apache, at best. Patchy, at best, is how you describe it. And, well, as I mentioned earlier, when Servera had taken command, not that long before the war began, he found that the fleet had not exercised since 1884. Which was not good. Not good at all. In fact, the last time they had taken exercise had been when the German Empire had threatened the Caroline Islands. So, his reaction to the crisis over Cuba, etc., had been to try and withdraw his fleet. He thought it might be best to bring it back to Spain and repair, rearm, fit the guns they're supposed to have, you know, then, then fight from there. Maybe pick up some of the new ships, which uh, or the ships which were in repair, refit, so they could come back stronger. But no, he is sent. He's at Cape Verde, and he's ordered to return to Cuba. And he does return to Cuba. He managed to slip past the Flying Squadron under Winfield Scott Schley. He managed to pit, slip past the North Atlantic Squadron under Ad, a Rear Admiral uh, William T. Sampson. And they slip in. In fact, the Americans don't even realise where he is for a couple of days. He's a fleet in being, which they're not sure where it's in being. Then, when they do realise where they are, they try and send in a Collier ship, the USS Merrimack. And the idea is it will sink and block them in. But the shore batteries this time work. And the crew get driven ashore. And so they're captured. And Sarah makes sure they are under his personal protection. He's bit worried about some of the statements coming out from various parts of the government of Spain in Cuba, and he makes sure that the Americans know that these crew are alive, they're fine, and they're under his protection. This earns him a lot of respect. He had objected when he was being sent back to Cuba. His objections are this. It is impossible for me to give you an idea of the surprise and the consternation experienced by all on the receipt of the order to sail. Indeed, that surprise is well justified, for nothing can be expected of this expedition except the total destruction of the fleet or its hasty and demoralized return. 
He is an experienced admiral. He's one of the best admirals the Spanish have. And yet he's saying, no, this is not a good idea. This is clearly not a good idea. Why are we doing this? Why? Why? Anyway. That is their plan. He goes to Cuba, he provides a fleet in being, he tries to keep his fleet alive, he tries to keep everything safe. And then eventually he is ordered to sail. He is ordered to go out and fight, to try and break through by the governor. And he can't countermand the governor. The, the only way he can countermand the governor is to rebel. So the governor is the civilian authority, he is given a direct order. He therefore he must sail. And this is the speech he sends round his crews before battle. The solemn moment has arrived to fight. This is what the sacred name of Spain and the honour of its glorious flag demands of us. I wanted you to attend this appointment with the enemy with me, wearing the dress uniform. I know that this order is strange, because it is improper in combat. But these are the clothes that the sailors of Spain wore on great solemnities. And I do not believe that there is a more solemn time in life of a sailor than that in which he dies for the homeland. The enemy covets our old and glorious hulks. For this, he has sent against us all the might of his young squadron. But only the splinters of our ships will, be able, will he be able to take, and only obtain our weapons when, corpses, we float on these waters, which have been and are Spain's. My sons, the enemy surpasses us in forces, but it does not equal us in valour. They are the flags and not a single prisoner. The motto of my squadron, long live Spain. Battle stations. And may the Lord welcome our souls. I'm not going to go into every ship and how it's run down. There is a whole argument afterwards between... The admiral in charge of the actual of the American forces during the action, and the admiral who had been in charge while you know in press setting bring the squadron up to there. But the thing is, Sampson, who was theoretically in operational command, had gone away. He was going off to meetings. He wasn't there in a battle. Schley was actually in command of the battle. Mahan gets involved in this and says, Samson trained the fleet, so she should have credit for the battle. No. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. You don't go, St. Vincent is responsible for the Battle of Trafalgar because he's responsible, he's the first seal responsible for training the fleet up, da 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 da. No. It's the person who's in charge during the battle. It's not fair. You can say it's downright cruel, but in the nicest way, if Severa and. Mojo are going to take the blame for the fact their fleets were in such poor nick because they're in command of the battle. You can't then turn around and go, well, no, we're blaming them, not the previous commanders by name, but we're going to give credit to the previous, to the person who'd organised this force rather than the person who was commanding a battle. You can't do that. You either have one standard and the person who's in tactical command, who's actually operating in command of the troops in the battle and actually in command of the forces engaged, is the one in charge of the battle. And that is Schley. But what happens is quite simple. With these orders, the Spanish column made its way around K. E. Smith at 9.31am on July the 3rd, leaving the channel about five minutes later. The Infanta Maria Teresa was in, in lead, followed by Vincenzo, which was having tr engine troubles, the Cristobal Colon, which of course has wooden guns, and the Amarante Gokeda. They're travelling between 8 and 10 knots, roughly 800 yards apart, followed by the Pluton and Fura. They then form three echelons. The destroyers heading eastward, followed by Colon and Amarante Gokeda, and the Infanta Maria Teresa and the Visea headed making for Brooklyn. Why? Because the only chance that Severa has seen for his fleet to survive is for Sonder Fleet to make basically heroic last stands. The destroyers are to blast the way through for 
the Amaranthi, uh, the Cristobal Colon and the Amaranthi Okeda, which they hope can make speed. The Vincenzia, which is having issues with its engines, and the Infanta Maria Teresa, which is his own flagship. They are going to fight. Why do I say this is a rough plan? Because this is what roughly happens. Brooklyn, which is Schley's ship, heads nearly straightly for the Infanta Maria the Teresa at first, but then has to turn around to because they're on a tradition course and then ends up doing a circle almost round the USS Texas. At which point something interesting happens. They had been sort of breaking up, but then after they saw engagement, the Cristobal Colon and the Amante Guerre fall in behind the Visaya. There is a dispute as to the exact orders which come out. But it seems to be that the captains and crews decide they're not going to leave their ammo behind to me. Um, considering what he was trying to do with breaking his fleet out, my strong suspicion is that no matter what orders might have been given in terms of paper form, rather than signals which could have been interpreted by all officers ashore, etc., those crews were not going to desert their Admiral. There is all sorts of tussle amongst the American squadron as to which ships are going to be in front, what they're going to be doing. But the Infantum and Theresa is hit by two 12-inch rounds uh, from roughly 2,600 yards by the Iowa, one of the battleships there. Iowa is raped by what some people class as the Crystal Colon secondary battery. But as we've been over, she only has a secondary battery. She doesn't have her primaries. They are wooden. So they're her primary battery. Okay, that's what she... But they are in very close range. At this point, with the melee going on, Servera signals to his other ships to continue to the southwest and to get away. And he charges with the Teresa straight at Brooklyn, his nearest enemy. The idea being he will create such a storm of fighting that the Americans will be drawn into it. Brooklyn is hit more than 20 times during the battle, but suffers only two casualties. Servera's, in contrast, bridge crew are mostly wiped out. And his ship begins to burn furiously. Her fire main was cut by one of the first shots, unfortunately, so she's having difficulty fighting the fire. And at this point, Severa orders her aground at 10.35 in shallow a.m. in the morning in shallows along the Cuban coast. Um, they are run aground. The ship is completely wrecked and the flame by it, but Servera and many of the crew are rescued. And again, this kind of countermands the sort of letter of the orders he's sort of given out of nail your flag to the mast, go down fighting. But honestly, I think some of the words were spoken for the audience ashore. This is not a man who wishes to throw away his crew's lives unnecessarily, or his fleet's lives. He did not want to do that when he was at Cape Verde. He did not want to do that at this point. Then we have the Puerto Rico campaign, which is almost entirely auxiliary cruisers turning up going, Hello, we're here. And ends with Terra, another of those 
little torpedo boat ships coming out, taking part in a fight, and the cruiser it's with, the auxiliary cruiser, breaking down, and the ships the Americans have, which includes the Suant Louis turning up again, basically using their overwhelming firepower to win. The Battle of San Juan is a battle which is another for the honor of the flag defense, which the Spanish do so many of in this war. And they really do. A lot of for the honor of the flag. And lots of ships get captured. Lots and lots of ships get captured. But the interesting thing is what they're captured by. This is an economic war. This is a cruiser war writ large. Although some of the ships which do the capturing are, of course, are technically called gunboats, which in British top pilots would be, at this time, third-class cruisers or sloops. Some of them are even more interesting. And some of them are the Americans' own destroyers. Uh, hang on, I'm pointing the wrong way. There you go. They're interesting ships. And this is the fleet that never makes it. This is Carrera's Relief Squadron. Which includes their latest cruiser and their battleship, which have been in refit in France. And it's being sent to the Philippines. And then gets called back because the Americans leak out that they might come to the Spanish coast. And the interesting thing is, and please note, the British provide a lot of support to the Americans during this operation. It's kind of like the Great White Fleet and various other times. The British are always happy to support the Americans because usually they're working in their interests as well. It stops the Germans getting into places. So, Spain's collapsing, Germany keeps being predatory. You have a choice of Germany or America. Let the Americans go for it. The Americans never fund anything for long. They get interested in things, they do it, then they don't fund it. <coughs> The trouble is, and this fleet gets held up because the Spanish refused, uh, the British refused to give the Spanish coal in Egypt, because it would in fact pay back their neutrality. But the trouble is, the British can do that as long as the Americans don't go into European waters, which is why I always find it funny every time the Spanish react to threats of the Americans coming into European waters. Because the Germans are repeatedly trying to uh, trying to organize a fleet to support the Europeans, you know, and the British are stopping them. But if the Americans had come into European waters, that would have been considered an affront to the old powers, and you would probably get the likes of France, Italy, and, and Germany, the Germany trying to be in the lead, sending ships down to s protect the Spanish and protect their own trade from being disrupted because it's going through Spanish waters. Because remember all the trade which goes down round Spain through the Mediterranean to the Far East, to the Far East, you know, for Europe terms, Asia, etc. That would be where they'd send a fleet. So at that point, there are two options for the British. Either they're supplying coal to the Americans and helping them get there because they would have to be in which case they could stop the coal and that would probably force the Americans to go home or if they think there's an actual capacity of the European allies sending their fleet down they don't have to choose are they going to fight on the side of the Americans which is going to put them at odds with the rest of Europe and cause them no non-stop trouble there or do they, do they take out the American fleet themselves and say, no, we will let you do what you want to do in the rest of the world, but we won't let you fight a war in Europe. It would put the British in a catch-22. America is largely still at this point isolationist, although slightly expansionist, and therefore are not really good allies for the British. They're potentially, because they share language, they share certain aspects of a worldview, which makes them more suitable for the British to work with than others. But the British are dealing with already a expansionist Germany, a France, which goes through phases, uh, crumbling Spain, Portugal having issues, Italy having other tendencies going on there. And 
the collapsing Ottoman Empire. Oh, and Russia keep threatening to try and invade everyone. The last thing they need really to do is to unite all that lot to come at them. That would be incredibly expensive. So the cheaper real politic version would be to go and stop the coal and, if necessary, deal with the American fleet themselves. Probably just take it. Uh, probably just invite it to Gibraltar and, and tell it you're now staying here. But whatever the scenario, that would have been the worst case of uh, the thing the Americans couldn't really do. It would have caused huge amount of trouble, which is why the Americans were never really going to do it. At no point, many many times, Spanish worry about this because the Americans leave, they're going to. But no point do they look at the actual logistics of doing it and think, "Hang on, how are the Americans going to support a fleet this distance?" Now, the only reason that Dewey is able to do what he is is thanks to the support of Hong Kong. And the rest of them, these operations, they're all operating from American home waters or with some very interesting merch and named merchant vessels supporting them. But no, that's life. So, I hope you enjoyed this. This is going to be a stitched together video, and it is going to have a question at the end. But before I get into the stitching, this is a message to Garcia, and this is the other thing this war produces a lot of myths. So, on one side, you have a beautifully written up essay which basically details this wonderful story of this officer being given these instructions by the president to go deliver a message to someone, and they go and they go through the forest and deliver a message. And, you know, it's brilliant. On the other hand, you have the actual assignment given to him, which was given to him by a major of intelligence who basically said, go and liaise, kind of a modern concept, find the general, liaise with them, and provide ongoing reports coming back of what they're going and da 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 needs. And what he actually does, which is turn up, in Kingston, Jamaica, which is, of course, a British colony. Using the help of the American consul there, get, making contact with the Cuban Freedom sort of Council, who then take him to Cuba and take him across on horses to find the general. He turns up with the general. He, deliver, he says, basically, tell me what you want and I'll take your officers back because I don't want to stay here. And then the general helps him get back and he da -da does. It's... There's the story and there's the reality. The story is a wonderfully impassioned call to arms and service and duty. It is a really worth reading. It's a wonderful book. The reality is a good example of why maybe blabbing everywhere about your supposed secret mission to all sorts of journalists, etc. can save you from a court martial when you don't follow orders. So what have we got coming up? Well, we've had the cruiser actions of the Spanish-American War, and we've got all this coming up. So... What's the question going to be? Because I always finish these, these videos off with a question. And I'm debating between three questions, I have to admit. One of them was going to be Samson or Schley. Please look it up and see who you think, is, uh, who you think deserves the uh, honour of having the battle credited to them. You can put in a third option, the Spanish government sacrificing their fleet if you want to. But I decided against that one. No. The option I thought I'd put in. And I would like you all to think about is why do you think? Because I said, I'm not sure. There are so many good arguments I've seen by historians. I'd like to hear your views as to why you think the Americans after this war go from a war which is shown the greatness of the cruiser and the utility of the cruiser for the American in, uh, American warfighting force 
to being obsessed with building battleships. Why? What happens? Anyway, thank you very much for your support. I hope you enjoyed the video, and as ever, thank you. None of this will be possible without your support, and really, it matters a lot. It just... I'm now categorized, I think, and you'll probably hear this if you listen to Bilge Points 100, as a public-facing historian, or at least a partially public-facing historian, in that I don't just think about teaching classes and writing um, sort of journal articles. I think about, I do a lot more writing books and also about as much teaching public lectures and YouTube part of that as I do university lectures. And being a public historian is interesting in academic terms, a public facing historian. There are some very interesting issues when it comes to perceptions within the academic community over the roles and to an extent the legitimacy in some respects of public historians. And without the support, and I'm not Although, frankly, it will be impossible to do without the financial support of Patreon and of the subscribers, the people who follow this, uh, this channel, the people who watch the videos and see the adverts and all the other things that you do, the Ko-fi and the PayPal and all the other things. No, without the actual people watching the videos, without the public interaction, it wouldn't be possible. It's just the public interaction which makes it viable. And the public interaction which makes it useful because as I've said many times before, my view of history is that we do not study it to keep it to ourselves. And if you don't share history and don't allow people to learn the lessons of history, sometimes their own way, sometimes you teach them lessons, sometimes most of the time though, you give the information, you give your analysis and you let them draw their own lessons from it because that's the best way to think about it, because humans are thinking creatures. We learn by thinking, we learn by doing. We don't learn by just going, hmm. That's the point of it. That's the point of doing this public-facing history for me, because to widen the historical debate and widen the inclusion, which is one reason why I do want you to answer that question as to why do you think the Americans after this war, which is a cruiser war through and through, cruisers in every way, shape and form, go battleship. Why? Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed.